Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. You know, NPR's Books We Love isn't just a collection of our favorite books of the year. It's a snapshot of what people were writing and what we as readers were responding to throughout the year. And it's interesting to sort of draw links between books that seemingly have nothing to do with each other. For instance, take the two books we're bringing you today. In a bit, we'll hear some in-depth reporting about the 2016 wildfires in Alberta, Canada, and what these huge fires say about our response to climate change. But first, Hannah Pilvinen talks to NPR's Scott Simon about her book, The End of Drum Time, which is about a Lutheran minister trying to convert a group of Scandinavian people in 1851. Now, (laughs) you might be wondering, what does that have to do with Canadian fires in 2016? But both books deal with people trying to wrap their head around these huge disasters and how confronting these, you know, acts of God can mean challenging your entire reason of being. That's after the break. This message comes from Apple. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones, friends, or family. They can use Apple Gift Card to buy Apple products, accessories, apps, and games. But they can also use the funds to pay for music, movies, TV shows, and more. Visit Apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. The end of drum time opens with an earthquake that shakes a small town in the Scandinavian tundra in 1851 while a Lutheran minister named Lars Levy, also known as Mad Lassie, is holding forth to his congregation of reindeer herders and their families. Let's ask Hannah Pilvinen, the author of this novel, to bring us there. The shaking stopped and the floor stilled, but the children screamed, and their mothers tried to still their screaming, and the men alternately laughed and shouted their fear. Lars Levy was filled mostly with amazement. Hadn't this happened when Christ had died? Hadn't God sent an earthquake to mark the moment of his sacrifice? The force of this realization nearly made Lars Levi fall to his own knees. He looked at his congregants, his parishioners, his reindeer skittish on the snow, and he saw them multiply before him, ten upon ten, so that the back of the church was not littered with drunks who stank of their drinking, but instead each face shone clean and each body's blood coursed with the mysteries and the magics of Christ— He found himself suddenly saying this, some form of this. He was talking without hearing himself speak, speaking without feeling himself think. This was what it was to be a mouthpiece for God. This. Hannah Pilvinen joins us now from Philadelphia. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm so happy to be here. It's 1851, but I think even even today people would think this is a sign of something, wouldn't they? Sure. I took this moment from an autobiography of that minister, Lars Levi de Lestadius. And while, of course, it's it's heavily fictionalized, certainly the act of nature is part of what engenders belief. It happens for us today. I think, you know, climate change can feel that way. Is this an act of God (laughs) or an act of man? (laughs) Mm. Uh, Tell us about this town of indigenous Sami people and Finns and Swedes and reindeer herders and Lutherans and even a few Russians. Sure. It's at the top of the world. So in the armpit of of Finland is Gara Suvanto, which is in the original Sami, Gara Savon. And Gara Savon is a town which is mostly made up of Sami reindeer herders. And in this town, you have everyone from every walk of life, but mostly what you have are herders who are stopping there on their way to and from the sea, following the reindeer on their reindeer migrations. There's a relationship that's considered kind of unlikely at the heart of much of the story. Ivar and Willa, what what do they see in each other? Willa is Lars Levi's daughter. So she's a minister's daughter, and she's always been around the reindeer herders, but they've always been at a distance. And what she knows of them is really the stories, some of her own father's research. And so I think at first for her, Ivar holds, he represents mystery. He represents escape from a very small cabin in which she lives with many siblings. And I think for Ivar, Willa is also mystery. He doesn't understand exactly 
exactly how she sees the world and how she sees him. And in some ways, he wants to see himself the way she sees him, which, which is full of this, you know, admiration, even while he's struggling to keep his herd alive. You, uh, you teach English at uh, Warren Wilson College. You're speaking to us from Philadelphia. How did you learn so much about reindeer herding? And please don't tell me, just go to YouTube or Masterclass. No, I won't say go to YouTube or Masterclass. I will say you, you need to go there yourself to the Arctic Circle. I stayed with the same family of Sami reindeer herders. I went six times over the past 10 years. I learned how to beat shoe grass. I learned how to uh, wrestle a reindeer calf to the ground. I learned how to earmark the calves. I went out in minus 40 degrees, and I think that more than anything, although I did a tremendous amount of research at various fellowships and libraries, more than anything, it was the time with the reindeer herders that made the biggest difference. Why did you want to immerse yourself in this time and place? Well, my first book, We Sinners, um, takes place among a small Finnish fundamentalist sect. Mm-hmm. which is Lestadianism, which is uh, the religion I was raised in. And that religion made its way over the Atlantic Ocean to America. And when I was researching it, it was the first time I realized, oh, this church, which I had always been told was Finnish, was not Finnish, really. And its roots were actually Sami. When I say its roots, what I mean by that, actually, is that the very emotions, the bedrock of the church, of the its understanding of faith itself was Sami and its emphasis on feeling over knowing or or almost rather I would say feeling as a way of knowing was inherently Sami. For me, it really was a um a discovery that a religion I had believed in as a child was not actually, I, I would never now in some ways call it a Finnish religion. Mm. There's a tough scene in which you describe in great detail the slaughtering of a uh, a doe. Mm. It's hard to read. There's blood. There's slaughtering bowls. You know, I think with the slaughtering, what it teaches you and what I learned there when I would see slaughters myself is that death is a part of life. The other thing that you learn there is that you are constantly in a state of accepting what happens to you and accepting that you don't control what happens to you. One of their common phrases there is, let the reindeer decide. It's a very anti-Western idea, right, where we need our trains to run exactly on time. And I think in many ways, let the reindeer decide means that part of that decision could also be death. (sighs) What do you think a novel can do to reveal people and worlds to us that are unfamiliar? For me, that was the a primary question in writing this novel is what can literature do to contain more than one way of seeing? And so one of the things I was really thinking about in the end of drum time was how am I going to write and craft a novel in which cultures are in collision with each other and people don't agree about what they see and people don't agree about what they know or what they believe. In some ways, it became a craft problem. It became a point of view problem. And ultimately, I landed on writing an omniscience, which of course we think of as a God voice. And I did that in part because I realized I want to use a God voice to try and write about many people's gods. And one of the other challenges was that I also had to show the limitations in the book of my own God voice to show the the, the boundaries of knowledge and not to act like any God or any knowledge, including my own, was actually omnipotent. Hannah Pilvinen, uh, her novel, The End of Drum Time. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Noom. Eating is an emotional experience, which is why managing your weight needs to be a psychological one. Noom uses science and personalization to help you manage your weight for the long term. Their psychology-based approach helps you build better habits and behaviors that are easier to maintain. The best part? You decide how Noom fits into your life, not the other way around. Sign up for your trial today at Noom.com. 
This message comes from NPR sponsor Autograph Collection, part of Marriott Bonvoy. Each of the almost 300 independent hotels in the Autograph Collection are designed to be exactly like nothing else. Visit autographcollection.com to find something unforgettable. This message comes from NPR sponsor Churchill Downs, presenting the 150th Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby has produced some of the most blood-pumping, tear-wiping, hove-thundering, moment-defining experiences on Earth. It's the wire-to-wire, across-the-board time of your life. Motion becomes poetry. Long shots become legends. Welcoming one and all to the greatest thrill on Earth. The 150th Kentucky Derby, on Saturday, May 4th. Learn more at KentuckyDerby.com. Fort McMurray in Alberta, Canada, is an oil boom town, and cashing in on oil has served the people there really well. And then the fires came. John Valiant's book, Fire Weather, is about those fires, and he told Here and Now's Peter O'Dowd about the sense of denial the people there feel about fossil fuels' connection to climate change. In the spring of 2016, a wildfire ignited in the forest of northern Alberta, Canada, that would forever change the lives of the people who lived in its path. Here's a reporter for Global News standing along the highway of Fort McMurray as the forests boil over with fire and threatens a line of cars that's trying to evacuate the city. Look at that. Like that, even in the past five minutes, has just flared up. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how long we'll be able to stay here, but it shows how quickly things are changing. Though miraculously no one died as a result of the flames, 2,500 homes and other structures were destroyed, thousands more were damaged, and the fire would burn through the desiccated forests of Canada for more than a year. John Valiant wrote a book about the fire. It is a finalist for this year's National Book Award for nonfiction. It's called Fire Weather, a true story from a hotter world. John Valiant, welcome to Here and Now, and congratulations. Peter, thank you. It's great to be with you. It's great to have you. And Fort McMurray, let's start there. It was a boomtown, the epitome of a boomtown, built on the incredible wealth of Alberta's tar sands industry. Tell me about Fort McMurray and why it was even there in the first place. (laughs) Yeah, it's an anomaly in North America. It's 600 miles north of the U.S. border, basically buried in the boreal forest. And it's an isolated bitumen, which is tar, refining and recovery project. What's extraordinary about it, it employs about 90,000 people. And in 2016, when the fire broke out, the median household income in that town was $200,000 a year. It was wealthy. It was also no stranger to forest fire, I understand. It is common in this part of the world, just not fires like the ones that showed up in early May. Yeah. I mean, what we're seeing happening in the boreal, which is the largest forest system on Earth, is it's been slowly drying out and heating up. So the temperature on on May 3rd, 2016, when the fire broke out, was over 90 degrees. Even scarier, really, was the relative humidity, which was 11%. And, Peter, you Mm. have to go to Death Valley to find comparable relative humidity. And that combination of rock-bottom humidity and high temperatures creates explosive conditions for fire. Well, in the early hours of this fire, it had gotten very close to the city. It wasn't quite there yet. I want to listen to this clip from Fire Chief Darby Allen, who actually was somewhat upbeat about avoiding disaster. Here he is briefing reporters. I'm more encouraged today that maybe it won't hit town. But last yesterday, we were pretty confident it was coming, and that's why we evacuated those people. And the slightest sign that we see that people are in jeopardy and safety we will evacuate again. So no one, I mean, not even the fire officials expected this level of destruction that was to come. Can you talk about how unprepared people were really for what was about to happen? It is baffling to me because the meteorologists did a perfect job. They forecasted the conditions going back six months. In fact, it was understood that 2016, because of El Nino, was going to be a brutal year for fire. They had it right several days out when they predicted the temperatures and dryness. And honestly, they had it 12 hours out when they predicted a wind shift toward town at lunchtime on the 3rd. Given the explosive conditions, it would have been clear to anybody familiar with 21st century boreal fire that embers would be able to drive across virtually any barrier firefighters put in its way. 
So why were the blindfolds on? I mean, you even write about someone going to drop off their dry cleaning as the flames are licking at the houses around them. I mean, why weren't people able to see the danger? This is a kind of cognitive glitch in Homo sapiens, Peter, that is going to put us on the back foot through all our responses to climate change. We base our responses on what we've already seen, what we've already dealt with. We haven't seen what climate change has in store for us in the 21st century. And so Fort McMurray, a very can-do, wealthy, as you know, um, effective, young, energetic town, you know, a true boom town in every sense, I think they really saw themselves as inviolable. You know, we've dealt with fires before, we can handle this, we got this. And the fact is, no, you don't. And no, we don't. Mm. Well, in fact, that was sort of the emotion that was going through Darby Allen's voice two days after that original piece of sound I played. Here he is speaking again, this time with the CBC. At this point, he could barely look at the camera when he described what had happened to the town. I, I would say it's been, the, <clears throat> it's been the worst day of my career. And I am, uh, you know, the whole... Uh, the, the people here are, are, are devastated. Everyone's devastated. How outmatched were the firefighters trying to put it out? They were totally outmatched. There wasn't one house on fire or 10 houses on fire. There were 50 houses on fire. And the radiant heat projecting off that wall of flame was about 1,000 degrees. So that's hotter than Venus. So all they could do was try to gather up as many people as they could and escape out of these burning neighborhoods. You've used the phrase uh, in our conversation, and you wrote about this several times in the book, a 21st century fire. In other words, this is the kind of fire that we're seeing now erupt across the Western United States, across Canada, Australia. This is something that we have never seen before. Why did you come back to that phrase so often? And I wonder what it means to you. I came back to it because all the evidence points to it. You know, what we see starting around 2000, which is when most climate scientists predicted we would start seeing noticeable changes in our atmosphere, is changes in fire behavior. And so one graphic example are these urban firestorms that previously were anomalies. You know, they've had them in California, they've had them in Australia through the 20th century, but these occurred decades apart. Starting around 2000 in Canada, these fires became more common. And then through the 2010s, Australia, you know, there was Black Saturday in, in 2009, and then there was the With fire fire. tornadoes, right? Exactly. There are these markers to me of what 21st century fire is. And one of those would be actual fire tornadoes, which are distinct from fire whirls, which are common in wildfires. But a fire tornado is an EF3 rated, home destroying, landscape altering event. Another example would be pyrocumulonimbus fire clouds. And these are stratosphere piercing systems that function almost like hurricanes in the sense of the way they turn and the way they perpetuate themselves by drawing in energy from the burning landscape. These generate their own lightning. They can start fires 20 miles away from the epicenter of the fire. They're essentially self-perpetuation machines of flame that can work their way across a landscape as long as the uh, heat and fuel holds up. That's just terrifying. And if we go back to Fort McMurray for a moment, um, there's an irony here, isn't there? The fossil fuel industry built this town, but also kind of helped destroy it by pumping decades of CO2 into the atmosphere. I mean, the houses that you described were full of furniture and countertops and carpets, all built with oil-based products. All of our houses have those things in them, right? I mean, and you remind us that the oil companies, they had been well aware of the problem that fossil fuels created for the environment for many, many years. So how did the people of Fort McMurray reflect on those connections, or did they at all? They are effectively in denial. Their conservative government is in denial. They will not discuss climate change or the petroleum Mm -hmm. industry's relationship to it because they are essentially captive to it. And and what we really need to understand is that the petroleum industry is, in essence, a fire industry. That's why we recover these substances from the ground, is to burn them. And so that means it's a CO2 industry, which means it's a climate-changing industry. And so for Fort McMurray to 
confront that would mean to radically alter their whole reason for being. And yet seven years after the fire, the oil and gas industry is under tremendous pressure to adapt to this changing, greener economy. So, I mean, what happened to Fort McMurray in the years since this fire? And, and do you, what do you think is ahead for them? Fort McMurray is trying to ride this gravy train as long as it can. There is undeniably a massive energy transition underway around the world. I mean, even Texas, a very close ally to Alberta. Alberta is basically the Texas of Canada. Texas is embracing uh, renewable energy with zeal, you could say, and they've actually tried to invest in Alberta, and Alberta has currently has a moratorium on all new green energy projects. Uh, just finally, before we let you go, I want to give you some credit for some absolutely beautiful poetic writing, especially about the fire itself. You often suggest, I think, that the flames appear to be alive in some mysterious way. How did your understanding of fire change as you wrote this book? You know, it's a cardinal sin to anthropomorphize, you know, non-human entities. But the fact is, fire behaves in a very lively way. It's not alive in the sense of being sentient, but the only reason we're alive is because we breathe and oxidize oxygen. Fire exists for exactly the same reason. And so we have a close affinity with fire, not unlike our affinity for dogs. You know, we domesticated this wild energy and brought it into our homes. And that is profound and has enormous implications for our future. And petroleum is this kind of quantum leap, you know, this extraordinary Promethean advance in our control of fire or our illusion of control of it. You know, it's significant, I think, and important to understand how intimate we are with it and how like us it is in certain respects. The book is called Fire Weather, A True Story from a Hotter World. It is a finalist for this year's National Book Award for Nonfiction. John Valiant, thank you very much for speaking with us. Oh, Peter, it was my pleasure. With NPR Plus, you get bonus content from behind the scenes of your favorite shows, like the NPR Politics Podcast. A friend of mine who worked at the Associated Press came in to the courtroom and said, Step to it. Michael Cohen has flipped on Trump. And with NPR Plus, you'll be supporting public media. Learn more at plus.npr.org. This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Doctors Without Borders. Around the world, Doctors Without Borders provides medical care wherever it's needed most. This giving week, make a life-saving impact. Learn more at doctorswithoutborders.org slash NPR.